Please be seated. There is a bit of tension in today's readings, I think. There's a discussion here between our second reading and the Gospel regarding the question of what theologians call theodicy. The word theodicy is a combination of two Greek words, God and justice, and as such is an explanation of how God remains good and just when the world is as unfair and unjust as it apparently is. Put differently, a theodicy is an attempt to answer the question of why bad things happen to good people. This question is having another moment, as the updates from the war in Ukraine continue to be difficult to hear. Innocent lives are lost daily. How can God be good and just when there are children dying before they have even had the chance to become good or bad people? There are many theodicies offered throughout the scriptures, many different and sometimes contradictory explanations for why the world is the way that it is. There are many explanations because, of course, everyone in history has faced this problem in one way or another in their lives. And further, there are many explanations because it is so difficult to find a satisfactory answer. Today's Gospel gives us Jesus Theodicy. It is not a very satisfying one, we should acknowledge, but it does have a precedent. Jesus is asked today about the death of some Galilean Jews who were executed by Pilate, with the grisly added detail that their own blood was mingled with the blood of the animals they had just sacrificed in the temple. The reason people are asking Jesus about this incident is perhaps subtle, but it makes sense that people would be particularly disturbed about the story in Jesus' time. These Galileans were, after all, on a religious pilgrimage. They had traveled from their homes in the Galilee region, several miles, to the temple in Jerusalem to perform their sacrifices, a core component of the Jewish religion at that time. And to perform a sacrifice is, in part, to make an offering for one's sins, and thereby to restore relationship with God. And yet, even after these Galileans had offered their sacrifices to God, even after, it seems, their relationship had been restored, the blood had already been spilled, they were killed by non-Jewish people in a supposedly sacred place. What results from this incident therefore, is a crisis of faith. How can these people who appear to be good and doing the right things religiously end up dead in this way? This objection to this outcome emerges from a number of places in the scripture where we are told, seemingly, that the good will be kept from harm and the sinners punished. The book of Proverbs tells us, for example, that the righteous will be protected, while the path of the sinner leads to death. Our second reading from 1 Corinthians says something similar. Paul tells us about the Israelites who followed Moses into the wilderness. Twice they sinned through idolatry and sexual immorality, and twice they were punished by God, with tens of thousands dying. For both of these explanations, then, bad things happen to those people who are bad. And the way to avoid tragedy is simply to avoid sin. But back to the Gospel now, and we find that Jesus does not offer the same explanation. He responds first to the question about the Galileans with a question of his own. Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans. Then he talks about another tragedy, equally freighted with religious significance. The Tower of Siloam fell over at some point and killed 18 people. And according to one interpretation I found, the Tower of Siloam was near the Pool of Siloam, which would make sense, which is mentioned in John's Gospel as the place where a blind man is given sight. 
The pool of Siloam was a place of prayer for healing, a place where persons with chronic illness or disability went to ask God for intervention. These people then, who had put their lives into God's hand because they had nowhere else to turn, lost their lives to what we sometimes call an act of God. So, Jesus says, do you think these tragedies happened because these two groups, who were literally in the midst of religious observances, literally in the midst of repenting, were worse sinners than everyone else in Jerusalem who goes on living? No, of course not. But no explanation is given beyond this. Yes, Jesus gives a warning to repent, but given what he has just explained in relation to two stories of people in the midst of repenting, it is apparent that that activity in itself guarantees nothing. Now, as I mentioned above, Jesus' answer has a precedent. His answer is the same as that offered directly by God in the book of Job. The book of Job is somewhat ironically treated as the preeminent book of theodicy. And it is ironic because it offers no theodicy at all. As the story goes, Job is a person who is without sin. He is allowed to be punished by God in all sorts of horrible ways, including illness, loss of possessions, loss of family. Job questions why God would do this, why God would allow this. And God says roughly what God says in our first reading from Exodus. I am who I am. Were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I made the sun and the moon and the earth itself? No? And you'll never understand. Where does this leave us? It leaves us in the same place as Jesus. Which is perhaps more pro profound if we consider again what Jesus' life looks like. Or if we consider, for that matter, the lives of many of the most important figures in both Judaism and Christianity. We read about Moses leading the Israelites to the Promised Land, but we do not read, at least today, about how he will die before the Israelites even make it there. And thus he will never be able to experience all of the blessings of that place. We know about Paul and all his sufferings. His letters are filled with references to his own hardships, though he says he doesn't like to talk about them. Paul, likewise, will die before his time executed by Roman authorities. Which leads us, of course, to the life of Jesus, the most blessed, the most graced Son of God, blameless, free of sin, a person who lived a life of goodness and love, and yet he dies in horrible fashion, executed unjustly in his early 30s. This is the perhaps unfortunate Christian theodicy. Why do bad things happen to good people? No explanation, really but a clear and established precedent given to us by our tradition. The very best of you, your most faithful and committed those in closest relationship with God, have always and will continue to face death and suffering in just the same way as everyone else. Even God himself is not above this. God himself, incarnate in Jesus, suffers and dies in just this very way, this seemingly unfair and impossible to understand way. I am always suspicious, therefore, of attempts to explain what Jesus himself does not attempt to explain. Giving reasons or logical arguments to justify something as terrible and difficult as the death of an innocent person, no matter how old, strikes me as both unconvincing and borderline offensive, especially for those who have experienced this loss. The only answer God really gives is to say, I did it too. I went through this too. I felt that pain before, and I feel it again, because I am here now with everyone in their pain. As God says to Moses in our first reading, I have observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry. Indeed, I know their sufferings. I will be with you. God is with us even though we do not understand the madness of this life. I hope we can find comfort and strength in that we are not alone. 
God is with us. Amen. stand to reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 